Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi. And once again, we have this great opportunity here on EWTN to hear another story, a conversion story. This, this time, uh, we're joined by Jeremy Christensen. He's a former Latter-day Saint, and he's the author of From the Susquehanna to the Tiber, a memoir of con conversion from Mormonism to the Roman Catholic Church. Jeremy, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear your story. Thank um, you. yeah, Mo Mormonism, uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, is a sector of religion, a sector of faith that many of us have run-ins with, but we don't know quite sure. as much about. And so excited to hear your story and fill us in a little bit. So yeah, start from the beginning. Where does uh, your story begin? So my story begins being born into a very active, faithful Mormon family. Uh, I was born in a small town in Utah, very rural area, and my parents were and still are really faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I had a pretty kind of normal upbringing in, in terms of faith formation. Faith was just really a important part of our life, fundamental. We prayed every morning together. We prayed every night together. We prayed over our meals together. We read the Book of Mormon every day as a family before we would head off and go to school. And it was just a sort of seamless part of, of my growing up. And we went to church every Sunday. And in, in, the, in the Mormon world, you, um, you have a lot of activity outside of Sunday too, sort of young men's and young women's programs and, and things during the week. And so that was really a part of, of how I grew up. And my parents are very devout and good people and taught me very early on to, to love God and to love Jesus. And that those were the most important things in life were, right. were God and family, you know, uh, not, not a bad way to grow up yeah. uh, by any means. And we, um, we were not... You know, we were not wealthy. Uh, we were probably poor <laughs> by some definition of that term. Uh, my mother stayed at home and raised us. My dad was a, a middle school shop teacher at the middle school there in our, our small little town. And we just we just kind of lived life. I, I, I think um, not, you know, a life pretty ordinary comparable to anybody else's. I think that People, a lot of people know uh, Mormons, and and I don't. I, I'll, I will say I don't say that term derisively. Right. I say it as a shorthand because it's a little uh, easier than the full name of, of the church, or I sort of use it interchangeably with Latter Day Saints and, right. and you know Mormons. Either way, but people know a Mormon family in their in their neighborhood, or they work with people, and Mormonism has. So so much good in, in terms of um, teaching family values. You know, I was very close to my family and, and having a sense of purpose in life that, that our purpose in life revolves around our family is very much part of how I was, how I was raised. Right. And, uh, you know, we, um, we were surrounded by other members of our faith. I think, my town has about 3,000 people still to this day. And I think hovered somewhere in like 80 to 85% uh, LDS. So, and, and kind of all, all of our families on, a, on either side, my, my mom's side and my dad's side of the family were, were more or less all members yeah. of the church. And so it was just very kind of, you know, um, all encompassing and, and uh, a really, you know, a good childhood, not one yeah. that that uh, in any way has anything I could ever complain about. Sure, <laughs> Jeremy, I've always been kind of curious again because, like, like you said, we we've all we've all met Mormons, Latter Day Saints, and, and again, they tend to be great families, really, yeah. really nice, wonderful people. And I've always kind of wondered on the on the level of kind of just your your day to day Mormon believer. I mean, we know, and you'll probably get into that. There's some pretty bigger theological differences if you yes. dig down in. But on the level of just a normal family living out their life, is it is it does it feel basically just like an evangelical Christianity, or where does it fit at that at that level? Yeah, level? I think I, yeah. so. Theologically, 
I, I don't think it's right to say Mormonism is a is a version of Protestantism. Right. It is kind right. of its own thing. It, yeah. it was probably, it was Protestant in its really earliest years, right. uh, but but sort of quickly took off in another direction. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of the day to day living experience, yeah, I got up every morning and we would say family prayers and we would read from the Book of Mormon and would go off to school and live life and yeah. we would go to church on Sunday and there would be activities during the week that you participate in. And, um, you know, in, in uh, Mormon uh, Sunday services, when I grew up, they were three hours. It was a three hour block uh, of three different meetings. So it was a lot of church. <laughs> <laughs> My kids sometimes complain now about mass being too long. And I'm like, you have no idea. I was a kid. When I was a kid, I went to church for three hours. Um, so, you know, it's uh, the way that the Mormon church is structured at the local level is full of lay leadership. Uh, my dad was the bishop of our ward. That would be something like the pastor of, of a congregation or of a parish, uh, roughly equivalent. Uh, and was that for, for five years. It's just volunteer. Everybody volunteers to do everything. And that's part of why there is so much involvement and why it's so important to people. But you, uh, like like Protestant services, uh, much of, of what they call sacrament meeting, which is where you would take the Lord's Supper, is devoted to, to preaching, right? That That's sort of the, the main Kind of component if you if you just look at how much time is spent during that hour on things and you get kind of used to public speaking in a way because you will not live a life as an active mormon without being asked to speak in yeah. church all from the time you're you're quite young and so you know you get versed in in the bible uh, at least uh, you know an lds understanding of the bible but certainly you know, reading the Bible a lot and um, and preaching yourself about the Bible, about the Book of Mormon, to to your own congregation. So that that is part of the formation. Um, like I said, we you know take the the Lord's Supper as Mormons. We would we would do that. We use bread and water, mm. and um, we would then have after that meeting. You know, there's singing. A lot of a lot of Mormon hymns are. Are unique to Mormonism, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't think the majority. I have never looked and sort of divided them up, but a lot of them are are recognizable Protestant hymns. You know, we sing "A, a Mighty Fortress Is Our God," right. uh, and and so there is a a Protestant ethos sort of baked into some of the worship right. on Sundays, and then there would be Sunday school classes and and the like. Um, uh, afterward, but I, I think all in all, a really normal life, a, a, a life very comparable to I think any American, you know, Protestant tradition. Right. We're speaking tonight with Jeremy Christensen, former Latter Day Saint. Um, you, you noted that your parents instilled in you a love of God, a love of Jesus. Who was Jesus in your understanding? So there is a lot to unpack there. Sure. <laughs> so. In, in the Mormon understanding of our Lord, you, you have to take a step back and think a little bit more broadly about Mormon cosmology, about how Mormons think about the nature of God and the nature of man and why we're here and what we're doing on, on earth in, under, in, in order to understand what uh, a Latter-day Saint means when he or she says Jesus. And... In, in the LDS worldview, we uh, had a pre-existence. So they believe in the pre-existence of, of our spirits, mm -hmm. that before we were born, we lived as spirits with God the Father and with Jesus Christ, who was his, his oldest, his eldest spirit child, and that we are all literally spirit children of God the Father. And that... God the Father has a physical body like we have now, and that God presented a plan to his children that they could become like him, that they could become a God someday, and that part of that plan entails going down to earth, getting a physical body, and being, being tested, essentially, to, to see if we would be obedient 
to the things God wants us to do. And that <clears throat> in this uh, sort of grand council in heaven, a, a dispute breaks out about how that plan is going to work. And that one of God's spirit children named Lucifer, who later becomes Satan, his idea of the plan is that he will force everybody to do good and he won't lose anybody. He'll bring them all back. But he wants all the glory to himself for this. Uh, our Heavenly Father's eldest spirit child, Jehovah, Jesus, says, I will let everybody have their free will as, as God has made us. And I will give all the glory to God, but I, I will go down and be the savior. And God said, that's, that's my will. That's what, that's what I want. That's the plan. And, and that sort of sets up, um, you know, what, what happens afterward, that there's, there's a war in heaven and Satan and his, uh, a third of God's spirit children are cast out and they become, you know, Satan and, and his, his, his fallen angels, mm -hmm. essentially. And then each of us is sent uh, as spirits down into a physical body, starting with Adam and Eve down to earth. And that the role of Jesus was to come, knowing that we would commit sins and make mistakes that would inhibit our ability to return back to live with God and become like him. And that he was sent down as a savior uh, to, to atone for our sins. And so in that sense, as I'm sure every Catholic who has just listened to this now says, well, that's quite, there are a lot of differences there. Um, you know, the, the nature of Jesus, uh, he, he is not consubstantial with the Father. They are, they are different essences. Right. They are different beings um, in, in that sense. And are um, that, that divinity, that Godhead is not a, descriptor of a unique nature, but rather a category of thing that God has become and wants us in his love to become like him. And so, so that, that long backstory is, is essential to understanding yeah. the, the LDS concept of who Jesus is. Right. Yeah. And again, like on the, on the, would that have been part of your Understanding at that at that point that, absolutely that basically you had that okay. absolutely yeah yeah gotcha. that that's how I understood Jesus and um, what they call the plan of salvation yeah. and all of this of course comes um, you know we we would get to this point soon all all of yeah. this comes uh, by virtue of the the founder of Mormonism of Joseph Smith that this is his his claim that this was revealed to him this is revelation from God as part of the restoration of the true church. And that part of growing up LDS and, and being LDS, and this is a really central concept, is this idea of continuing revelation. I think for Catholics, uh, a, maybe a very rough comparator is that we, we believe in private revelation, right? There's public revelation and there's private revelation. And one way of thinking about it would be that uh, the LDS Church doesn't distinguish between the two mm. as much, and that per, that uh, revelation is is ongoing and continuous even at the public revelation level. But that each of us can know that that Joseph Smith was a prophet called by God to restore the true Church after an apostasy, that the Book of Mormon is what it claims to be, that the head of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the successor to Peter and, and uh, God's prophet on the earth through personal revelation that God will give to us through the Holy Spirit in, in what they call a testimony. And that this is a, just a fundamental way of how I was raised, of, yeah. my, of my parents wanting me to know for myself. Uh, that, that, that is a thing, you know, everybody, when... when, when LDS people talk about the, the parable of the ten virgins in the Bible, yeah. for instance. They will frequently talk about um, the idea of living on borrowed light hmm. and connect it to the testimony. That, that the lesson to be learned is that some of these virgins were wise and had gained their own testimony, their own light, right? And But 
you have to gain your own at some point. You can't live on other people's borrowed light. And the foolish virgins had not prepared and not, not you know, got that experience for themselves. And so you're raised um, with this idea, and it, it's found in the Book of Mormon, uh, toward the end of the book, one of the, the you know, prophet writers, ancient American prophets, that, that's, and we can get into that more later, but that, that writes says, you know, essentially kind of breaking the fourth wall of the book, says those, you know, who read this, if you read um, sincerely, having faith in Christ and being, you know, willing to do what God wants you to do, he will manifest the truth of the Book of Mormon to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. That's, that's what it says. And so this idea that God communicates in a very subjective way to us through an identifiable experience that's elaborated more on in Mormonism is really central. And in some other Mormon scriptures uh, called the Doctrine and Covenants, there's a little more elaboration on this concept, and they'll, they'll call it that, uh, a burning in the bosom, that, that that is how you will know when God is telling you that something is true. Hmm. Uh, and each month, once a month, uh, usually the, the first Sunday of, of the month, they have in, in Mormon meetings, rather than assigned uh, talks or kind of homilies, <clears throat> They have kind of sort of like an open mic uh, 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 event called fast and testimony meeting. So Mormons fast during that first weekend of the month. And then they have a testimony meeting where people get up and they bear their testimony and say, I know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church on the face of the earth. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet. I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I know that you know, the current leader of the church is, is a living prophet. I know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And that, that this is based on this experience that you are taught, that's what you are looking for. You are taught to, to read the Book of Mormon, to pray about it, <clears throat> to pray, um, to know that it's true, and that at some point God is going to give you this experience, this burning in the bosom, and that you will know in a way that supersedes logic in a way that supersedes any other kind of way you could know something and gives you this epistemological knowledge that is that is more than certain that's kind of the goal yeah. uh, that that you are that you're aiming towards when you're when you're raised in the church it's interesting we were talking about this a little bit before, beforehand obviously that's very different from Catholicism yeah but in some sense the, the the similarity is that the Catholic Church will also help to form your understanding of faith and reason and how to interpret your experience and how to bring that together with the, yes. the revelation. Um, there's a different formation there as Mormonism, but you know, you, you make me think of like the discernment of spirits. Like we have spiritual writers who, you know, throughout the centuries have, have sort of taught us how, how do I approach truth? Right. How do I approach knowledge? How do I approach faith? How do I bring them together in terms of my own experience? It's just a question of whether you have a church and a spiritual tradition that's going to help you rightly, you know, yeah, those, yeah, yeah, because it is this, um, it is this difficult thing. It, it would be undeniable. It would be really wrong to deny the element of subjectivity in the human experience, right. because that is, at some level, the definition <laughs> yeah. of human experience, <laughs> experience right? Yeah. Is um, and so, uh, you know, I think like a lot of things that are not true uh, that we would call heresy, uh, there is something true. Right, that th there are there are true things um, that uh, other denominations may focus on uh, to a fault, mm -hmm. right? And that that that's the the beauty of the Catholic tradition, being Catholic, being mm -hmm. universal, is that uh, yes and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> attitude, and um, but but that you know it is a big difference, and it is a little bit hard to com to communicate to people yeah. who haven't been raised in it. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, one, one difference is the relationship between faith and reason is not as integral. And that when it comes to something that we will also get to later, I'm sure, mm. the difficulties that one encounters in either uh, the logic of Mormon theology or in early Mormon history, when one encounters those difficulties, 
the way that the LDS Church uh, teaches you to go about that is, in, in my own experience, that that reason needs to be set aside. Yeah. It's not like, um, I think, a, a wonderful term that we'll always attribute to Bishop Robert Barron. It's not, in the Catholic tradition, we admit of things that are supra-rational, that are logical and coherent in their own articulation, but are not things knowable just by dint of our natural reason, Mysteries. like the inner, the inner life of, yeah. of God, the Trinity. Right. Uh, but it's supra-rational. It's coherent in and of itself, but is something beyond uh, what we could grasp at. Or like C.S. Lewis's great example, and then Carl Sagan used it for very different purposes <laughs> in Cosmos. Um, you know, a, a two-dimensional being uh, interacting with a three-dimensional object would just have no in principle, would not be capable of comprehending, what do you mean up? Yeah. Right? What does that mean? And and in the same way, a, a three-dimensional being, if it were to interact with a fourth-dimensional one, that's a mathematically, you know, coherent idea, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I can't grasp it. Um, that That's the way I think the Catholic tradition, in a, in a very summarized way, a, approaches this question. Whereas, the tradition I was raised in uh, does partake of, of sort of fideism, mm. of, of sort of, well, there are some things you're just going to have to, right. your reason's just wrong. Um, and and so that, you know, that became a challenge later in life sure. as I grew up. Well, t take us back into the narrative a little bit. So where, where do we left off? Here? Yeah, I, you know, I, as a young child, I think Mormonism didn't, necessarily stick or unstick it was just sort of what life was right i was a pretty unruly teenager uh, to put it mildly <laughs> <laughs> but um i like to think about the big questions i liked to think about god and you know i flirted i think as a lot of teenagers do with atheism and but because some of some of the music i listened to some punk rock music sort of pushed me in that direction, but some of it was rather thoughtful and, and made you think about the, the big questions. Is God really there? Really? Um, and the concept of God that I had is very different from the you know classical theism or, or the Catholic tradition. And I, you know, I had some very rough years there, but about the age of 17 or 18, I was having some difficulty in life and I read, I, I in, a, in a moment of kind of anguish, of wanting God to reach out to me, opened the Book of Mormon, and I read uh, Mosiah, in the Book of Mosiah, uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. <laughs> I still remember it. And, and I had this experience. I became emotionally overwhelmed, and I felt... Peace. I felt like this was speaking exactly what I needed to hear right at that moment. And I thought, this is it. This is what I've been told my whole life. I'm, I'm looking for. This is a testimony. This is true. All this stuff I've been taught about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and um, the plan of salvation, these things are true. And it is so hard to communicate <laughs> what a powerful experience that is mm. and how convincing that experience is. And I was really, really on fire for the faith from that point. I had some changes I had to make in my life, uh, but I made them and I began to prepare really um, deeply to do what young men in the Mormon church do <laughs> now at, at age 18, but then at age 19, which was to go uh, be a missionary for the Mormon church, like my dad had been, my older brothers had been. And so I went through that preparation process. And the way it works, you you fill out all your paperwork and you send it in and they just tell you where you're going. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't get to choose. And I was called to serve in the Buenos Aires North Mission in Buenos Aires, Argentina uh, for two years. And so I went to the... Uh, Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah, where you do 
training both in how to kind of teach the more or less prepared lessons that Mormon missionaries teach, of how to do a presentation of, of the Mormon understanding of um, dispensationalism and the great apostasy and what they call the restoration. Right. And, and to teach these things and also to learn uh, a new language, to learn Spanish. And was there for a couple of months and then was shipped off on a plane uh, to, to Argentina where I spent two years. Um, you know, you get one day off, you get a half a day off, your preparation day. I think, I think ours was on Wednesdays at the time. And you have sort of from the morning until uh, early evening, you do your laundry, go grocery shopping, maybe see a couple of sites, a couple of things like that. And, and then you're back on. But otherwise, mm-hmm. you spend every day out in the street uh, approaching people. I'm sure you have been approached by more yeah. missionaries more than once in your life. And um, not knocking on doors in Argentina, you clap, you stand outside the gate and clap. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but essentially knocking on doors and talking to people on buses the way I say, it's, it's like you feel like you're living in the book of Acts. <laughs> um, it's, it has a bit of a monastic component in, in terms of the rigor. There's a lot of rules, as one might expect, if you're going to send a bunch of 19-year-old boys <laughs> <laughs> unsupervised out yeah. into the reaches of the earth to represent your church. There are a lot of rules that you're expected to keep. Uh, but that that was an incredibly formative period for me, both just in terms of kind of becoming an adult, living, not just living on your own, but, you know, living, walking in dangerous neighborhoods. You know, I spent a lot of time in very, very rough neighborhoods yeah. in, in Argentina and, um, and uh, taking care of yourself and really dedicating yourself to trying to tell people what you believe is true. Yeah. And find people and share that message because you feel it so deeply and you're there to help them have that same experience. Yeah. Well, let's leave it there for a moment and take a quick break and we'll come back picking up in, in sort of the quintessential, at least from, from the outside, the quintessential Mormon experience of, of the missionary territory, the mission field. So we'll pick up your story there. Okay. Again, we're joined tonight by Jeremy Christensen, former Latter-day Saint, and he's the author of From the Susquehanna to the Tiber, a Memoir of Conversion, from Mormonism to the Roman Catholic Church. And so we'll be back to hear the rest of his story in just a minute. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight talking with Jeremy Christensen. He's a former Latter-day Saint and the author of From the Susquehanna to the Tiber, a memoir of conversion from Mormonism to the Roman Catholic Church. And it's been a great story so far, Jeremy, and I really appreciate you kind of filling in some of the background to, uh, to Mormonism, to mm-hmm. Latter-day Saints that many of us are not familiar with. It's really interesting, so I'm excited to hear the rest of it. When you left off, you were doing the Mormon thing. <laughs> you were yeah. out knocking on doors or clapping. You know. Yeah, I was in, in Argentina. <laughs> Um, with the white shirt and the little yeah. black tag and, and everything. Again, you know, a really formative experience um, in, in my life and deepened my my faith mm-hmm. and my belief that God is sort of always giving you this revelation. You, you um, have these experiences in Mormonism that once you, you have the gift of the Holy Ghost, that that you receive impressions sort of all of the time about what you're supposed to be doing and you and you sort of follow them and as a missionary you're kind of very focused in on this and so you you in your own view it seems like god is incredibly active in this day-to-day work that you're doing finding people here when you didn't have anybody to talk to and and um you become very convinced and i I came home after two years and I set about doing what I had always been taught to do uh, and have no regret about, which is uh, starting my life uh, of getting married and and raising a family. And I, I think Mormons are fairly well known for doing those things. And uh, I met my wife at sort of a, a young single adult activity 
uh, shortly after I got home and we dated very quickly and were engaged and got married. We were sealed in the, the Mormon temple in Los Angeles, California. She's from Southern California and began our life. Uh, I, I was going to school. She was a couple years older than me. So she was teaching. She had already graduated from college. I was going through undergraduate and uh, we had children right away. And I was called, as they say, called into various leadership positions. I served in a in a Mormon bishopric when I was 22 and um, in what they call elders quorum presidency. It would be a counselor. And then later on, when I was in law school, I was the elders quorum president, which is a lot of responsibility outside of just, say, going to a Sunday meeting. Right. And but by this point, when I get called as an elders quorum president, I am in law school, uh, which is very demanding, uh, a lot of time spent studying. And then a lot of time outside uh, ministering, essentially, right, to people in our congregation, taking care of their physical needs, helping people who um, maybe need food or help paying bills or have some kind of spiritual issues they're dealing with, all kinds of stuff. And, and um, that's very stressful. It was a very mm -hmm. difficult, difficult time. I had four children at that point. And, um, you know, I was very focused on my studies, and that meant a lot to me. And I had an experience when I was what they call being set apart. When, when you receive one of these callings, they, the, the leader in charge will lay his hands on your head and sort of give you a, an impromptu blessing that is really understood like God is speaking to you through this person. And, you know, some kind of specific promises were made when that happened. And I felt that same feeling that I had felt, you know, over and over so many times from that first time when I read the Book of Mormon. And it felt like, yeah, this is true. What he's saying is, is right. This is like revelation from God. And it, to, to put it shortly, it didn't work out quite the opposite. And that really caused a problem for me. It, it was so, um, it wasn't like a huge thing in, in, in and of itself, but it was like, I felt the same thing I'd always felt with some of these bigger events. It's what I had always been taught that you're looking for when God is confirming that something's true to you, giving you personal revelation. And it caused a lot of cognitive dissonance. And I actually, I got really depressed. It was a really dark time. And at the same time, there's something else going on in the world of Mormonism. And this, this would have been in, say, 2013, give or, give or take. Uh, the internet really got ahead of, of the Mormon church. And it used to be, if you wanted to learn a lot about the very niche area of early Mormon history, you'd have to find a book in a library. And it's not like early Mormon history is something everybody, you know, is just dying to know about and read yeah. about. But with the rise of the internet, so, so many primary sources about early Mormon history and scholarly books um, from a kind of disinterested perspective on Mormon history uh, became readily accessible. And there was a lot of news at the time. I was living in Salt Lake City, uh, and it's very hard to avoid the church uh, being a part of your existence living in Salt Lake City and being in an intellectual profession like the law. And there, there were news stories of people leaving the LDS church over historical issues. And I knew about some of these things at some superficial level. Uh, but uh, there were some high profile excommunications that had happened of people kind of publicizing these issues. And it, it was kind of in the air. And those two things converged, this kind of spiritual crisis of like, why did, why did God promise me a thing that not just didn't happen, but like the exact opposite happened yeah. and, and was really kind of spiritually devastating to me at the same time of there being a lot in the air about early Mormonism. And I had a point where after some time, I just had a, a moment, I think of, of honesty, um, that's really important that 
I said, what if it's not true? And I let myself think it, not in a, in a, in a very real way, like internally. What if this isn't true? Wouldn't I want to know that? And that was a really big moment to allow myself to kind of step outside of myself for a moment to, to let that come through. And I decided to, to just really take a logical look at things and not, not think about the story of Mormonism from the perspective that the church insisted, you know, read about it from these, from our sources, from these sources. And I did a lot of reading and a lot of study about Joseph Smith, about, uh, about the founding of Mormonism, about the production of the Book of Mormon, about early Mormon doctrines and, and how they changed and how they developed over a very short period of time. And I had a realization that it, whatever else it was, it, it wasn't what it claimed to be. It wasn't true. And all of these experiences I had had, as difficult as that was, because my entire relationship with God was wrapped up in these personal experiences that I had had, uh, you know, I, I just had to kind of admit, well, the reason that a lot of times they didn't work out and you kind of set them to the side was maybe it wasn't God talking to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's not what it was or not fully what it was. And... You know, that, that was a, I call it a dark night of the soul because it was a very, very difficult time, but a necessary time. Uh, nobody comes to God uh, through a path of all sunshine and roses. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. It didn't work that way for our Lord. Uh, he, d he did not do what he needed to do, everything being sunshine and roses. And that's just not the way life is. That said, you know, it was, a, it was a hard time. My wife was very Mormon still, and my children were being raised. I, I was sort of the one who reneged on the deal here. And so that, that was a difficult time. It was a strain on our marriage. And, you know, thanks be to God, we pulled through that. But it, uh, a rough time where I spent time not as anything. I still believed in God pretty vaguely, but was definitely kind of new Mm -hmm. Mormonism's not what it told me it was. It's not true. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what I am, but I'm not that. Right. So what was your recourse there? Where did you go? What did you do with all that? Hmm. For for some time, and that would have been from uh you know, 20 say 2016 uh around the fall of 2016 when I told my wife. It it had happened earlier, but I mm -hmm. I told her about it in the fall of 2016. And, you know, I spent time just um, not thinking a whole lot. I mean, I thought a lot about God, but I wasn't looking to join another church. In some sense, I thought I might build my own idiosyncratic set of beliefs. And because I, I still vaguely believed in God. And, and, but it was a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> it was a dark yeah. time. And I think my wife definitely could sense it of Jeremy is, is really struggling in, in a lot of ways. And I focused a lot on my work. I have a busy job anyway, but I, I just really, really, really focused on my profession and, and my work. And, um, and, and I thought a lot about God, but, but wasn't really sure what to do. And it's hard to explain exactly how it happened because it was quite coincidental. Providential is really the better word. But um, I stumbled across at some point a, a, a reference to the church fathers. I never heard of these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of coming out of Mormonism, which is a, a King James only, not like the King James only evangelicals, but they, they use the King James Bible and it's, their yeah. only Bible that they they use in English. And so I was doing a lot of reading, like I read other translations of the Bible and do more reading into New Testament scholarship and learn more about early Christianity in the New Testament, which were things I didn't really know a lot about. And, and I, I had a conversation with a, a Catholic friend who was asking me about Mormonism and said, 
oh, so your your concept of Jesus is kind of kind of like Arianism, and I, <laughs> what's well, Arianism? I don't I don't I don't know what that yeah. is. I was unfamiliar, and I kind of realized I don't really know a lot about Christianity, yeah, uh, historically, and and I um, I did not want to be Catholic. I I even said once to somebody when I, I bought a, a set of the Church Fathers because I liked the way the books looked. <laughs> and the first the first volume was the Apostolic Fathers, and they were yeah. a handsome set of books <laughs> off of my shelf. And I said to a friend, I don't really care what happened <clears throat> once the Catholic Church got its hands on Christianity, but I am interested in just sort of seeing what things early Christians believed that I might pick here and there from to kind of make my own set of beliefs. Yeah. And uh, and I started to, I read the, the Apostolic Fathers uh, for the first time. No no commentaries or anything like that. I just sat through, I would come home every night and I would stay up late into the night reading. And I was, you know, this is tales old as time. I am not the first person on this program to say <laughs> this. I won't be the last person on this program to say this. Right, I was really shocked by what I found and really troubled uh, to see what, what I saw at the time, just this level of continuity with a church that definitely was, you know, wasn't the Mormon church. There, there wasn't anything in early Christianity that even remotely looked like Mormonism. But I started to see very quickly, these people are, are Catholic. These people sound like Catholics. They believe there are a certain number of things here that these people believe in that are our Catholic ideas. One of, one of the biggest ones being the real presence. That one um, was just really evident to me. Yeah. And, and it struck me, it was deep. It was this idea of, well, I consider myself Christian and always had, but I thought, uh, but I don't, Christians don't, or, or, uh, Mormons don't believe in the real presence. And the, the, the Last Supper, the sacrament as they call it, is, 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 covenantal in nature and purely symbolic. And I said to myself, how is it that I can call myself Christian and identify with, with this tradition, but not believe a thing that seemed really important and really evident uh, in, in early Christianity? And it troubled me. Yeah. Uh, it, it was difficult for me to reconcile that because it wasn't something I believed. <laughs> I thought yeah. that's, that idea is ridiculous or, or um, difficult to believe. Mm -hmm. But these people believed it. Um, and that, you know, that really set me on a course to, to start thinking about Catholicism and trying to understand it because I, I just realized I really didn't know anything about it. I'd had moments of interaction with Catholicism, very small. I was in Argentina, but mm -hmm. most people who were Faithfully Catholic wouldn't talk to me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't have any real understanding of Catholic teaching, very straw man level understanding mm -hmm. of what Catholics believed. And so I started to, to become more familiar with it. The Church Fathers uh, really moved me. It was just such a beautiful account of this rigorous tradition. And then... You know, you it, it probably sounds trite to, to anyone coming from a tr Christian tradition. But for a Mormon, when you read the early church fathers uh, prior to the time of Nicaea, so before the, their, or even uh, Tertullian, before they're really using sharply kind of theologically identifiable Trinitarian language as that language gets more refined over time. But the idea that the Father is God and Jesus is God, there is only one God, was so evident, but a big deal <laughs> to right. somebody coming from a non-Trinitarian, right. non-Nicene background. And to see the role of reason uh, in the use of, um, you know, the early apologists like Justin Martyr, they're, they're latching on to and their recognition of the role of reason in understanding the true faith, uh, their in that issue in particular, their reliance on on logos theology, right, and just the entire understanding from the Western tradition of what the logos 
means or meant and how Christians then understood that idea of, of this rational ordering, this intelligibility to created order personified in the second person of the Trinity, right? right? And that um, was, was really impactful to me because it set me on this path of starting to look at the intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church, a, a religion that at the very high superficial level, even as a Mormon you're taught, is sort of not a rational religion. It's, it's, it's superstitious. It believes in, you know, say a prayer to this saint, and you'll, you'll find your keys. And, <laughs> and you know, and mm -hmm. I know it looks like bread, and it tastes like bread, and it smells like bread, but it's not. The, the, it, it, it kind of approaches Catholicism as, you know, kind of for benighted people. And I came into contact with Augustine <laughs> and was like, wait, I thought, you know, people living in the, you know, fourth of the century weren't bright people. And to just come into contact with a mind and a soul like Augustine was so moving, but just revelatory about how deep this intellectual tradition of the church is. And then, of course, to, to start um, reading Thomas Aquinas and and seeing the way that the church approached faith and reason. Yeah. And then reading, I, I just never forget the first time I really opened up and read uh, uh, St. John Henry Newman's mm. uh, essay on the development of Christian doctrine. And hearing somebody speak in such a sophisticated way about belief in God, in a serious way, in a way that demands um, engagement, from serious-minded people was so foreign to me uh, that it wasn't just a, well, it's a thing I believe because God just told me in this real subjective special way, and if you pray about it too, you'll know it too. And I know that it might not make sense, but <laughs> but it's true. From moving to that, to the grandeur of, of the Catholic intellectual tradition, and from the idea that we are made in the image of God, because God has fingers and toes like we do, right? To we are made in the image of God because God has, has given to us the thing that makes us most like him, which is our reason, our intellect. And that, that our reason is, is a gift from God. And it is a beautiful way of, of knowing him, of knowing things about him. And that, you know, the, the church approaches the question of faith and reason from such an integral way mm -hmm. uh, that marries these two as undeniable components of human reality. It's hard to articulate how big that was, right. <laughs> how big that yeah. was for me, um, how much that, that drew me in as this thing that was always there in the world that I didn't know anything about. And then found out about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeremy, we have about seven minutes left. So <clears throat> you discover this, this deep and wide tradition. What impact did it have on your life? Yeah. Uh, it changed my life forever. Yeah. Uh, if you had, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, um, when, uh, or 14, when, when my wife and I had first gotten married that in 14 years, you're going to be a Roman Catholic and all of your children and your wife will also be Roman Catholics. Uh, it, it is, the furthest thing that was ever from my mind. I never sat down to read the church fathers thinking, what's Catholicism about? Right. It was quite by accident. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it was a difficult time when I uh, decided to become Catholic. Uh, less for my wife, who, who saw good changes in me happening, but more for my family, you know, my parents and my in-laws and my siblings and, and whatnot. They are all... Uh, for the most part, they were all still active members of the LDS Church, and that's a difficult time. Faith is not a small matter yeah. to my family. It never was, and I, I thank God for that. I'm very appreciative to my family for teaching me that religion is not just, you know, 
a taste like we have among other tastes. Right. It's not. And, uh, you know, I... I made that journey. I started to to go to mass. I'd never been to a mass before. Uh, I went to a Latin mass. It was the first mass I'd ever been to. So I, you know, I went I went whole hog in in sort of what is the Catholicism of my imagination yeah. like, and was moved by the beauty of Catholic liturgy, uh, and decided you know ultimately, I was sitting in a hotel room in Las Vegas in the summer of 2018, and I'd been speaking with a priest some about it and I, I just decided there was no lightning bolt there was no kind of big moment I, it just I had been thinking about it for a long time and studying about it and it seemed right and I said I'm going to become going to become Catholic and going to be baptized you need to be baptized uh, if you're a Mormon coming into Catholicism and uh, you know it has been uh, it has been a journey home. Yeah. Um, it, it is amazing how, how at home we feel, you know, it took time for my wife to eventually come, come around. I never thought she would. My pastor said he was, he was so confident. He was like, she'll, she'll become Catholic. And I was like, you are out of your mind. <laughs> you, you, you are completely out of your mind. But, um, you know, God's providence worked mm -hmm. in our life and it, it has changed us and, um, you know, coming to know the sacramental life and to enter into that life has been has been great. Uh, it is not easy to be Catholic. Uh, the Catholic Church has a wonderful, I hope all Catholics can understand, and, and Mormons too, I hope that this is something that interests them, uh, a wonderful teaching about the role of suffering in our existence that does not deny that that suffering is there and that it's real and that it hurts and it's painful. Leaving Mormonism and becoming Catholic was a painful experience, uh, but that pain serves a very real purpose in our life. And uh, you know, it, it has it has been it has been for the good. Yeah. And I, I hope that you know I, I am not maybe the best salesman to to my former co-religionists about why they ought to become Catholic. I have. I am. Uh, I wrote the book for personal reasons to kind of record why I believed what I believed and how I changed and how that how that worked out. But I do hope that those who are in a similar position to mine in Mormonism right now will know. I just want them just to have a taste that the, there there is something very intriguing and beautiful and good and true in Catholicism that maybe they haven't really thought about. And that maybe they ought to sit down and engage with this beautiful tradition. If nothing else, just to understand something that I assure them as I, you know, I didn't know what it was all about. Uh, but that, that there's something really there uh, for them to look at. Yeah. Well, the book is From the Susquehanna to the Tiber, a memoir of conversion from Mormonism to the Roman Catholic Church. And I encourage people to check that out from, from Ignatius. Ignatius Press. You, know, you mentioned a moment ago talking about God's providence and your, and your wife's journey and everything. And, and what, <clears throat> what comes to mind, again, throughout your journey, from a background that to many of us is, is much further than we're sort of normally right. thinking in terms of, but the reality of grace, right? that God's always working on every individual through mm -hmm. their, their family, through their experiences, even through their, their subjective experiences that they're yeah. not sure how to interpret yet, that yeah. God's grace is always at work. Yeah, you know? it's, it's like... Uh, I. I you probably won't be surprised. I'm a really big fan of Evelyn Waugh's novel, Brideshead Revisited. Yeah. And that line, uh, quoted from Fa the Father Brown books, um, uh, you know, that that uh, God lets us wander to the ends of the earth and brings us back with a twitch upon the thread. Yeah. And that that's really how it feels. Um, you know, it is I still don't have some highly detailed explanation of of uh, all of my experience in Mormonism, but nor do I feel actually a need to, to have them because you stand on the tail end of it and see God's providence yeah. that he works in individual people's lives in ways that sometimes you don't even understand that he's doing it at the time. And it's only a bit afterward that you start to see, wow, yeah. you know, I, I meandered about for almost 30 years right. as a Mormon before I 
found the Catholic Church. Yeah. That makes a really great story. Yeah, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Jeremy, Thanks for, for joining us. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. Again, uh, check out Jeremy's book, From the Susquehanna to the Tiber. Uh, and as always, again, if you're on a journey, we'd love to walk with you and be praying for you. So check out chnetwork.org. You'll find lots of other stories like Jeremy's as well as resources and fellowship for you on your journey as you continue to follow Jesus Christ wherever he's leading you. So God bless. Once again, we'll see you next week here on the Journey Home program.